bit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear Kevin Brown asking for information about renting an apartment through an agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Hello. My name's Kevin Brown. I saw your advertisement in today's local paper, Apartments to Let in All Areas of the City. Yes, Mr Brown. Uh, we currently have several properties available. What part of the city were you thinking of? Well, city centre, ideally. OK. And what price range are you interested in? Um, I don't really know. What have you got? Well, uh, prices start at £400 a month, going up to £1,000 a month. OK. And what's the difference? What does the price depend on? Well, uh, the number of bedrooms mainly. Uh -huh. The cheaper apartments have one bedroom, while the most expensive have three or four bedrooms. OK. Two bedrooms would be nice. So I'll say two bedrooms up to 600 a month. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Right, sir. We have... Uh, just give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have two properties that might interest you. One is in North Street... It's, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a very nice apartment, uh, but it's £750 a month. Uh, but that includes a private parking space. Hmm, £750. That's a bit higher than I'd like to go, really. Do you have anything less expensive? Uh, yes. Uh, we have another one at £625 a month. £625? Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. Where is it? It's in Cornell Road, at number 12B. I don't know that. How do you spell it? It's C-O-R-N-E-L-L. -L. It's near the park. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it on a map. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, would you like to see the apartment, sir? Yes, I would. I'd like to rent somewhere fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Would tomorrow be possible? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm afraid nobody is available all day tomorrow. It's quite a busy time of year for us. I see. But if you're free later today, you could see it at 5.15. Sure, no problem. I could manage that. OK. So that'll be uh, 5.15 with my colleague Jason. Mm. He'll meet you at the apartment. That's fine. And one more thing. What do I need to provide to rent an apartment with you? What documents, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Um, do you have a job? Yes, I work in a travel agency. Well, uh, a reference letter from your employer, you know, saying you work for them, and a deposit, which is one month's rent plus a fee of £60. What's that for? It's an administration fee to cover the cost of preparing the contract. OK. And one last thing. When would this apartment be available? It's empty now, so you could move in as soon as the contract was signed. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Brown. <laughs> that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between a senior librarian and a woman interested in working at the library. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Um, I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um, what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down, but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects. Right. But I don't know if I have the right skills. Well, we do provide training. Oh. We always include an orientation to the library, together with emergency procedures. That's fire regulations, emergency exits, first aid so you can cope with accidents or sudden illness. Things like that which are necessary for anyone who's working with the public. Then we give specialist training for particular projects, like using our database system. I do have quite good computer skills, in fact. Oh, great. Is there any sort of uh, dress requirement? Well, all staff have to wear a name badge, uh, so they can be identified if they go outside the staff-only areas. But apart from that, there aren't many regulations. We ask you to sign in and sign out for insurance purposes, but that's all. How about transport? Do you live locally? Well, not too far away. I'm at Pauper's Beach. My husband needs a car during the day, but it's only about 20 minutes on the bus. In fact, we can reimburse part of your travel expenses in that case. Oh! Would that be the same if I came by car? No, uh, because parking is such a problem here. One thing we are looking for, though, is someone who can drive a minibus. No problem. So, do the projects involve going outside the library? Some, yes, but not all. We've just finished one which involved working with photographs taken of the area 50 or 100 years ago. It basically involved what we call encapsulation. Putting them in some sort of covers to keep them safe? Exactly. <laughs> it's time-consuming work and we were very grateful to have help with it. Then, sometime next year, we're hoping to begin working on an initiative involving the sorting and labelling of objects relating to local history. We'll be needing help with the cataloguing. Well, I'd definitely be interested. How about at present? Well, we have a small team who work to support those who are unable to read. Working with the blind? Yes, or other groups who have reading difficulties. We provide volunteers with equipment so that they can take books home with them and read them aloud onto CDs. We're gradually building up a collection that can be lent to those who need them. Hmm, I can see it would be useful, but I'd really like to do some sort of work where I can get the chance to meet people. How about reading stories to children? Mm, that's done by our regular staff. But we do have another project... It's a very long-established scheme which involves helping those who are unable to have direct access to the library. Oh, I noticed someone with a trolley of books when I was at the hospital last week. That sort of thing. That would have been one of ours, yes. It's one of our most popular services. Lots of people who wouldn't dream of going to the library normally or when they're at home borrow a book when the trolley comes round the ward. I can imagine. <laughs> Yes, I'd definitely be interested in that. Right, so how do I enrol? Well, we do ask all volunteers to commit themselves to a regular period each week. I could probably do five or six hours. Oh, be careful not to take on too much. But we do need someone for a couple of afternoons from two to four. So four hours altogether. That sounds fine.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Right, so here's the application form. It asks the usual questions, name and address and telephone number. You also need to fill in details of who we should get in touch with in case of any accident or problem like that. Uh, we do need to have that filled in. And there's a space for date of birth, but that's only if you're over 75, so uh, we won't worry about that. No. <laughs> oh, it asks for qualifications. Do I need to provide certificates? They're not necessary. We'll need the names of two referees, not relatives or family members, obviously. Uh, what else? Signature of parent or guardian. <laughs> that won't be necessary, as I assume you're over 18. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's this? It says civil conviction check. That's a document we have to provide by law for those working on projects involving children. So we won't need it in your case. But you will need to sign this separate document. That's a, a copy of commitment. It's basically an agreement to work according to the library guidelines. So if you'd like to fill this all in, you can do it here or take it home, whichever you prefer. I'll take it home if that's OK. Right. Well, thank you for your time. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. John has applied to train as a teacher and is being interviewed. In this stage of the interview, the interviewer will discuss John's previous studies and work experiences. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello. Uh, come in and take a seat. <laughs> you are... Uh, John Evans? Yes, I am. Well, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the purpose of this part of the interview is to go over your CV and talk a little further about your previous studies and experiences. Yes. So, your first degree was in French, of course. Yes, with a minor in film studies. Hmm, an interesting combination. Mostly French films, presumably? Well, European cinema in general, but with a bias towards French cinema. Ah, and your degree took four years? Yes. In the third year, I was an exchange student at Bruges University in Belgium. Ah. I was there for a full academic year, nine months. Hmm, right. Well, you graduated two years ago and then you, uh, you took some time out, as it were. Yes, I spent six months as a volunteer working on restoring historic buildings in France. Oh. Was that with a well-known organisation? They're called Restoration Vacations here, but they operate under different names in several countries. I think they're quite well known. Hmm. So, uh, it was a six-month vacation, really? No, I went for a week, but really liked it, and I got asked to stay on as a translator. Oh. Because I could speak French quite well, it was my job to liaise between the owners of the buildings and the English-speaking volunteers. Hmm. 
That must have been a very enjoyable experience. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, it was certainly a very enjoyable experience to begin with, but after the first three months or so, I actually got a bit bored. Oh. I was talking about the same things every day. Bricks, cement, window frames, that kind of thing. <laughs> it wasn't really stretching my French. Also, I wasn't getting paid. Just free accommodation and food plus some pocket money. Ah, oh, I see. So then you started working for a bank in Paris. Um, uh, BCFC, I think. Uh, ah, yes. Were you doing entirely translating again? Well, translating was the major part of it, mostly from English into French this time. Official documents, letters, that kind of thing. Much more challenging. But I was also in charge of coordinating the translation work going on in the bank's offices in Switzerland, Belgium and other parts of France. Huh. What did that involve? It was simple, really. I just had to keep track of what had been translated in each office. To save wasting time having the same document translated twice in different offices. So, uh, you stayed there for a year and a half and then you left. Uh, why was that? Simple. To apply for this course. I see. Why give up a secure job in Paris to train as a teacher here? I've always imagined that I'd be a teacher, really. I loved being in Paris, but I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life working for a bank. Ah. Do you think your experiences in France will help you as a teacher of French? It certainly helped my French. And my experiences certainly gave me a much better understanding of French culture. Mm. Although that may not be of enormous use when it comes to standing up in front of a class of British 13-year-olds. <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you very much. The next stage of the interview will be conducted by my colleague in room 207. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a talk on the subject of the urban landscape. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked today to talk to you about the urban landscape. There are two major areas that I will focus on in my talk. How vegetation can have a significant effect on urban climate and how we can better plan our cities using trees to provide a more comfortable environment for us to live in. Trees can have a significant impact on our cities. They can make a city as a whole a bit less windy, or a bit more windy if that's what you want. They can make it a bit cooler if it's a hot summer day in an Australian city, 
or they can make it a bit more humid if it's a dry inland city. On the local scale, that is in particular areas within the city, trees can make the local area more shady, cooler, more humid and much less windy. In fact, trees and planting of various kinds can be used to make city streets actually less dangerous in particular areas. How do trees do all that, you ask? Well, the main difference between a tree and a building is a tree has got an internal mechanism to keep the temperature regulated. It evaporates water through its leaves, and that means that the temperature of the leaves is never very far from our own body temperature. The temperature of a building surface on a hot sunny day can easily be 20 degrees more than our temperature. Trees, on the other hand, remain cooler than buildings because they sweat. This means that they can humidify the air and cool it, a property which can be exploited to improve the local climate. Trees can also help break the force of winds. The reason that high buildings make it windier at ground level is that as the wind goes higher and higher, it goes faster and faster. When the wind hits the building, it has to go somewhere. Some of it goes over the top and some goes around the sides of the building, forcing those high-level winds down to ground level. That doesn't happen when you have trees. Trees filter the wind and considerably reduce it, preventing those very large strong gusts that you so often find around tall buildings. Another problem in built-up areas is that traffic noise is intensified by tall buildings. By planting a belt of trees at the side of the road, you can make things a little quieter, but much of the vehicle noise still goes through the trees. Trees can also help reduce the amount of noise in the surroundings, although the effect is not as large as people like to think. Low-frequency noise in particular just goes through the trees as though they aren't there. Although trees can significantly improve the local climate, they do, however, take up a lot of space. There are root systems to consider, and branches blocking windows and so on. It may therefore be difficult to fit trees into the local landscape. There is not a great deal you can do if you have what we call a street canyon, a whole set of high-rises enclosed in a narrow street. Trees need water to grow. They also need some sunlight to grow, and you need room to put them. If you have the chance of knocking buildings down and replacing them, then suddenly you can start looking at different ways to design the streets and to introduce tree planting. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute 